I thank all of you who have uh, joined us and those of you who are watching later as well. Obviously, we're in some sort of extraordinary uh, period of time right now. And there's a lot of things to cover, and I'm hoping that you'll find the information I've prepared today to be useful. Hopefully, those of you that are joined by video can see on your screen um, in, the, in the corner the, the PowerPoint. We can certainly make those slides available later. Um, those of you who are reading covidandmarkets.com every day, um, the, some of the slides will look familiar. But the content I prepared is, is brand new here today in terms of some perspective issues around the health pandemic, around the market response, the economy, and so forth. Um, there's one kind of intervening circumstance that is making me want to do a sort of interruption for my normal talk to give a little explanation to people because I've been inundated with some requests about it here this morning. Uh, those of you that are cursed with turning on financial media in the morning uh, may be hearing that oil was down, you know, 50%, 60%. And technically right now, if they were being honest, they would say it is down 99% because it is trading at 21 cents right now. So if anybody really believes that oil is 30 cents and is down 99% today, um, then, then uh, you know, I got a bridge to sell you. Um, this is maybe media hype or, or whatnot, or maybe them not fully understanding it, but more likely it's just um, them not going to the trouble of explaining the mechanics that oil uh, it trades on forward contracts, futures market, and that the delivery for May expires tonight, and that the price for June delivery as they go into the next one month contract, is trading like $22 a barrel. And this is the May price expiring and it just happens to be at the most severe contango we've ever seen where the price from delivery tonight into one month out is literally that far apart. That's how much excess supply there is and people looking to take delivery have no place to put the oil. Everything I just said sounds a little confusing and, and yet I needed to explain it on purpose because I do fear there are some that might just see a uh, click on a website, see a, a you know clickbait or or even a corner of their screen, and think that oil has gone to zero, and it's really a more technical complication. So with that out of the way, we can actually begin the purpose of our talk here today. And and as I said before, it really is to try to provide a little bit broader perspective on the things that we're facing. And we did a talk similar, although we didn't have video, uh, but we did an audio talk. Um, nationally on March 17th. So uh, it'll be five weeks tomorrow. And if I think back to everything that's happened in the last five weeks, it is literally um, unfathomable. And if I think even just a couple weeks before then, it's unfathomable. Uh, a lot of you may feel this way. I'm hoping that most people feel that way because of all the things happening in their lives and in society and in, in the broader issue of the quarantine and sheltering in place and that they don't feel that way for the exact same reasons that I do, and I'm sure many of my partners and colleagues at the Bond Syndrome do, which is um, being you know, reasonably obsessed and inundated with everything happening inside of the market. Um, but, but certainly there were a few weeks there in March where even people who don't do this for a living probably felt uh, somewhat captivated by the events of what were taking place. There, there's been a bit of normalization, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But um, the fact of the matter is, even as we sit here now, with an awful lot of things much better than where they were at March 17th, and a lot of the uncertainties of March 17th um, becoming much less uncertain, and I'm going to talk about that as well, we still do live in highly uncertain times, and we are living through an experience that is, is utterly surreal to have had uh, so much of American life and American economic life effectively shut down. So what I want to do today is talk about the short-term, mid-term, and longer-term ramifications, talk about the health realities, the economic uh, situation, and then, of course, specifically to market and portfolio. And we're going to take as many questions as we can, and I'm going to try to follow them on my screen when we get there. And, and um, then if you want to, if you're not on the video, if you're only on the audio, if you want to send a question to covid at thebonsongroup.com. We set up a special email so that I'll be able to get those questions directly when um, we, we actually start uh, the Q&A. So with that said, in terms of, let me click here my screen. 
the, the health issues right now are, are mostly um, very positive from a trajectory sense. And what I mean by that is that when you have um, a few thousand people a day dying, you cannot call it a positive thing. It's awful. Of course, we have thousands and thousands of people die in our country every day. But to have such a high concentration with one particular health pandemic, I'm not going to be here spending any time today minimizing the health reality of it. It's severe. It's awful. Most of us now know people who have uh, had COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. Uh, many of us know people who have maybe even had it severely. And of course, Lord willing, most of us know a significant amount of people, if not all people, that had, had healed and recovered from it. But the reality is it is a, is a significant issue. Um, even if the mortality rate ends up being as low as I believe it's going to end up proving to be, the highly uh, infectious and contagious nature of it, the ease of spread communally, has certainly made standard comparisons to the flu, I think, inappropriate. Um, and so as we sit here now just trying to gauge the impact of the health pandemic, we do know that case growth has dramatically slowed. We were sitting at uh, in between 10 and 15 percent per day growth uh, a few weeks ago. We've slowed that down to 3 to 4 percent daily growth. So it's still growing, but the percentage growth is dramatically stalled, which is how the models have recalibrated uh, a much lower case uh, expansion. Um, the hospitalizations uh, have gone down dramatically. You see in the top right quadrant on your screen, particularly in New York City, which has really been the main hub of coronavirus for our country, as far as major metropolitan areas go, um, is in just a, and thank God for this, a drastically uh, different situation than it was just uh, a few um, weeks ago. And, and so uh, we see the kind of decline of cases, decline of hospitalization, um, much higher capacity uh, for hospital beds and, and ICU and, of course, equipment uh, primarily around ventilators, which had been uh, a very um, concerning dynamic a couple of weeks ago. So I, I think that the, a lot of the market's rebound in the last couple of weeks has been related to the fact that some of the big tail risk, the really worst case scenarios, some of the doomsday scenarios about, um, I think one famous hedge funder said hell was coming because all the hospitals were going to be overrun and so forth. And most people have been able to discount that possibility out. And yet, nevertheless, we still struggle with the spread and trying to get that curve not only bent, but now fully declined where, where the coronavirus can be behind us. Um, economically, then, the, the uh, subject comes up because of the remedy. The virus had the risk it, it represented in society. And the remedy that our policymakers chose was effectively a shutdown of the country. And, and it is very true that a lot of the forced shutdowns did not take effect until right at the time I was doing our last call, which was in the 24 and 48 hours after March 17th, particularly in California and New York. But um, the reality is that uh, effectively, many pockets had kind of been in a shutdown, a shutdown already just sort of voluntarily because people now with the fear and the awareness and so forth were already sort of staying home, not going out and so forth. So you had a kind of declining economic activity and then it led to a mandated um, uh, shutdown of economic activity. And, and the damage has been severe, highlighted in the unemployment number over the last several weeks. Um, first, the industrial production came out last week. You see a very significant drop in manufacturing. Auto manufacturing uh, declined dramatically. And, and, mo and again, this is with maybe a month of some normalized industrial activity. Retail and food services, um, after such a huge buildup of consumer and, and economic activity post-financial uh, crisis, you just saw this kind of completely collapse in, in uh, the second half of March and certainly now into April with a significant amount of restaurants around the country shut down, um, albeit a lot of fast food restaurants still having drive through and obviously restaurants having delivery service. But shopping malls, retail, you can imagine it's, it's just uh, utterly awful. But I mentioned the, the job situation and, and this is where a lot of the stimulus comes in, a lot of the policy targets are focused at uh, right now with four weeks of uh, initial weekly jobless claims, we're at total 22 million. Um, and that is sort of from the first week of shutdown all the way through the last four. Started at roughly three and a half million, then we had two weeks over six and a half million. 
that we had another five and a half million last week. So as far as people who have made a claim of joblessness, you, you had uh, 22 million people in the last four weeks. Um, stimulus checks have started to hit, uh, their, first of all, was the direct payment to, to taxpayers, $1,200 for individuals who made under certain income thresholds. Um, for married couple, $2,400, and then $500 for two kids under age 17. So you basically had $3,400 injected directly. But as far as the unemployment side, you have uh, an additional $600 a week uh, unemployment benefit from the feds. And then you also have the um, Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses to try to keep people on payroll. And we'll see what that does after the economy is able to partially reopen to stem the tide of some of the um, unemployment that we're experiencing. But it's very difficult to have any kind of constructive view on the economy in the present tense. I, I do not, I really want to be very careful in the way I say things. If you happen to see me on maybe a television interview or even in our time here today, anything I write about at Dividend Cafe or whatnot, there is absolutely no possibility that I will be belittling the violence of what's happening in the economy. Um, I couldn't if I tried, statistically and qualitatively. It is just simply extraordinary. When I refer to not being surprised by a bad economic number, it's not because I don't think the economic number is a big deal. It, it, it's because it's, I'm assuming all economic numbers are going to be atrocious for the month of March, April, and then, and then we'll see as things kind of tether into May and beyond. And, and a lot of those things are certainly the more important aspects for markets and probably not even May for markets, but into June and then well into Q3 and even Q4. But, but I think economically, we know that there is some range of bad. There's no possibility of good. It's just a matter of is it this bad all the way up to this bad and we're somewhere in between. Uh, I looked at housing starts last week and was somewhat shocked to hear that um, building permits were down like five or six percent, housing starts were down 22 percent, because I sort of figured that it would be um, down 100 percent. Like I couldn't imagine that there were people pulling permits to start building new homes. And of course, some of the building permits are commercial, and there was obviously the first week of March where maybe a lot of activity happened. But the reality is that all the numbers are awful, and some you could have thought would be worse, some you might have thought would be better. but. I don't think that um, we should be confused about any of this. The economy is more or less shut down, and therefore everything's going to be awful in the industrial side of the economy, the consumer side of the economy. And of course, there are certain pockets where things that are still happening, certain service sectors are still able to get some things done. Um, obviously, there's some businesses that have a greater amount of business that, uh, you know, because of the product they sell, uh, food delivery services, things like that may see an enhancement. But in a macroeconomic sense, the aggregate demand has been sucked out of the economy and therefore the aggregate supply uh, gets sort of stuck in place and we await for the economy to reopen so that we can begin to normalize both supply and demand functions in our economy. So this leads me to where we are kind of from a market standpoint. And I want to um, reiterate some of the things I said back on March 17th, because it really remains my view now. It's just that we're a few weeks further along into it. If you recall, March 17th, I was speaking the day after, I believe what was the worst day of the whole market crash in March. I think the Dow was down 3,000 points on Monday the 16th. It had been down 2,000 points on two different days the week prior. And... Um, we ended up still getting lower uh, all the way to the 23rd and, 20, and uh, morning of the 24th the following week. And, and since then, the markets have not revisited those really low levels at uh, 18,200, and the Dow closed roughly around 19,000. So that represents the intraday low and the um, closing low that we had seen back in the third week of March. Um, but on March 17th, what I spoke to was this concept of two phases, that the markets were so violently oversold, there was such an incredible amount of forced selling in the marketplace that there was going to be two different phases of recovery, of people looking to see equity prices restored to kind of the values that we had seen just a few weeks before coronavirus. And in fact, um, 
what I believe took place you know, over these last 5,000 points, technically it's closer to 6,000 from that intraday bottom, but 25 to 30% recovery in stocks at this time represents a lot of that elimination of the forced selling, that sort of phase one. And then, and then I think we will soon, as the economy gets ready to reopen, be able to enter phase two, um, which I'm going to be calling the grind. Now, let me first kind of give you a little context on phase one. Uh, the Phase one I would just refer to as the, the time period after the national margin call, where almost every forced seller in the country was having to put forward assets to sell to redeem for cash. In a lot of cases, that involved stocks. It also ended up involving all kinds of high-quality bonds, uh, mortgages, and, and so forth. There was no asset um, that one could easily redeem for cash with so much selling pressure in the market at that time. And it led to tremendous dislocations and tremendous technical selling pressures. And, and I was pleading with clients at that time to not sell in the midst of a full-blown stampede, that there would come a point in which the technical pressures would be lessened and that there was some degree of mathematical recovery that was going to come very quickly. And, and so I believe that that could have taken four months. It, it could have taken um, two months. I didn't think it would happen in two to three weeks, which which has thus far been the case. Now, you, by the way, before I go to my next point, someone could say, are you saying that we, have, we won't go lower, that that first half of the recovery has now taken place, a bottom has been put in? I am not saying that. I do think it's entirely possible day by day. There is nothing the markets could do right now that will surprise me. The only thing that surprises me is being surrounded by folks in the media, the uh, other financial professionals, that express surprise every day or whatever might be happening up, down. They seem to get all surprised and I'm surprised that they're surprised. Uh, I think I said that right. The reality is that I'm referring to a selling pressure that was technically driven um, at the heat of that panic level two, three weeks ago. At this point now, actually four weeks ago. Um, where markets go from here, up or down, I believe will be more fundamentally driven, and that's what we have to kind of talk about. But the slides you see on the screen right now allude to what I'm referring to. I don't think most people understand what risk parity is. Um, forced selling is a great way to put it because it captures all categories of forced sellers. But risk parity essentially had about 400 billion of risk sellings, primarily large hedge funds in a given strategy that their uh, ratio of assets relationship to one another got so broken it was forcing uh, mostly from algorithms and computers violent amounts of equities to be sold into the market and then of course a lot of, uh, of other bonds ended up getting sold too. You look at various quantitative strategies, uh, market neutral strategies, let alone various rebalancings and, and individual panic uh, selling out of mutual funds that have daily redemptions. Uh, the amount that was being pushed through the funnel in a couple of days ended up being hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, so when you look at this chart here and you see where the Dow was before coronavirus at the top, then that pretty significant drop had a couple of hiccups up on the way, but then where it kind of hit that bottom level and then you see where we are now. Um, it's not exact to the math, but the basic point I'm going to try to make today is that more or less we have lost about 10,000 points and more or less we made about 5,000 back. And so I'm dividing the two phases of this into the first 5,000 points and the second 5,000 points. And this is pretty much the way I described it five weeks ago as well. And it is my belief that the first five weeks was it was my belief it was going to happen very quickly, and it is my belief that it did happen quickly, even if there ends up being some some sell-offs and checkbacks from here. The point being that the what wherever the move from let's call it down 24 or 25,000 to 28, 29,000, that to me is going to be a much different experience, a much longer process, uh, more of a grind through the economy. But again, more driven by various fundamentals and right now, uncertain fundamentals. It isn't that that can't happen because the fundamentals are too negative to let it happen. 
the point is the, the fundamentals into Q3, Q4, what's going to do well, what's not going to do well, the magnitude of recovery, all of these things are what we have to talk about today, and I'm going to share with you the way we plan to approach it prudently at the Bonson Group. So that represents kind of the construct I want you to have of the two different phases. And, and the grind phase really presupposes that we are getting ready for a sort of reopening of America. And I think that the when is going to have a lot to do with the how long it will take. If we were fully, completely shut down in our country for all the way through the end of June, let's say, another two months plus change, that leads to a much longer recovery period than if we start reopening in, in say, a couple of weeks. None of what I'm here saying today is advocating for what state should be reopening, in what way, when. Um, I have a lot of opinions on all those things. Uh, my opinions should be taken for exactly what they are, just my personal opinions. But I guess the point I'm making is that I don't believe um, we can totally understand the when of our recovery until we understand how long the shutdown is that we have to recover from. And I think it's becoming more and more apparent on a daily basis that there will not just be a light turning on 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 May 1st or May 15th or whatnot. There will be some degree of reopening taking place very soon, and then that will be phased over a period of time. In my Saturday COVID and markets, I um, uh, provided, I think, a pretty succinct and hopefully helpful summary of the federal government's uh, kind of deck around reopening the guidance they've given on to governors that basically calls for a phase one after 14 days of improved um, uh, what they call gating in their own state and then phase two after another 14 days of not seeing it worsen and then a phase three after another 14 days. So I imagine there'll be some states that are going into phase one on May 1 and will be well into phase three by the middle of June, which is, in, which is a, almost a full reopening. And I think there are some states that most clearly will not be. Um, so that will represent a, um, a very divergent uh, uh, response geographically, but macroeconomically, it kind of points to the challenges that lie ahead, engaging supply and demand in our economy as we get out of this sort of worst part of the health pandemic. And so my job as the chief investment officer at Bonson Group and what our investment committee is doing and what our investment professionals, the advisors that steward client capital, uh, our firm have to do is take a given client's financial plan and their own objectives and optimize the portfolio solution given the macro circumstances we face that make sense for that particular client. And we have to do that of all sorts of clients of different temperaments, different cash flow needs, uh, different timelines, and so forth. And that's why I think customized money management be becomes very important in a time like this. So I'm going to talk right now about our focus on dividend growth equities and how we're approaching some themes within our portfolio. But it's important to understand that some clients may have a 70% weighting into dividend stocks right now, or may come out of this with a 70% weighting. Other clients might only have a 20% weighting. The weightings of asset classes, the way in which we're moving knobs right now is really being done with a highly customized basis. Now, the um, summary right now I want to give you is not totally scientific, but I think it gives you kind of a loose um, understanding because really you could argue that healthcare at different times might be a cyclical or a, or a less cyclical type space. I think it generally is much more non-cyclical than cyclical, and that's especially true right now. But we have really divided up our portfolio, which is a dividend growth portfolio is entirely consisting of stocks that we believe are going to continue paying and growing their dividend. And, and it's the reason why March of, of 2020 was the worst month in, in equity markets and what our equity prices would have been going back to the financial crisis. This has got to be true of any equity investor. And yet the income we generated in March of 2020 was higher than the income we generated in March of 2019. And in 2019, the stock market was up 25%. And so the, that point of the underlying dividend growth being what's driving our decision making, I can't make clear enough how important that is and how um, relevant it is to income-oriented investors in a period like this. 
having a somewhat negative or cautious or careful view of the stock market doesn't speak to what cash flow generation goals would be or the most optimal way to achieve them. That's what we're trying to solve for uh, in the portfolio decisions we're making. Now, when I talk about the, the sort of division of non-cyclical, cyclicals, healthcare, what I mean is uh, by far the best performing sector ha has been healthcare, and, and they basically have an aggregate, a positive return through this whole period. And, but my point being that there is a sort of um, technical and fundamental backdrop to the healthcare sector that we, every company we own, we own because of the company fundamentals. And those companies we own because we believe that they will continue to perform and grow the dividends that they're paying us as investors. And yet, we don't really fit them into a cyclical versus non-cyclical bucket, where we wanted to have a kind of non-cyclical bucket, which is our way of saying companies that we think are going to perform very well, uh, that are not going to be um, you know, facing credit risk, are not going to be impaired as a result of the obvious macroeconomic damage that the present shutdown is doing. And you look at more stable companies that have more durable products, durable businesses, often more blue chip oriented, but um, these are companies that we think, if anything, might even benefit out of the needs and economic complexities of COVID. Um, these kind of really staple type names that we think provide a lot of balance sheet strength and we think provide uh, wonderful dividend opportunities from now till kingdom come. They're more stable, they're lower beta, and when in fact markets are rip roaring, we don't think they're going to do as well, but they give uh, a lot of stability and a lot of muted volatility in the portfolio. But it's the cyclical side of things that we want to pay a lot of attention to because we very much want our clients to benefit from the recovery. Certainly these names have led the really big move up in stocks over the last several weeks. Some of the names in our kind of cyclical bucket have done very, very well. Uh, from their bottom points, but they also were the ones that were down more going when markets were headed down. Wherever we go in the third quarter, fourth quarter, over the next three, six, nine months, we think these names um, represent bigger opportunities and yet have higher volatility um, along the way, expected volatility because of their beta and, and them being just uh, more, not more susceptible, but uh, more prone to sentiment-driven issues as well as some of the macro overhangs, particularly in the energy sector. So what I'm going to do right now is walk you through a few different themes that we have um, as equity investors, and, and certainly feel free to send any questions you may have when we get to the Q&A. Um, we do not believe that these healthcare companies that perform very well are overpriced. Uh, you'll remember that some of them even have a certain consumer division. They're always doing new R&D. There's always M&A possibilities. The ones we own tend to have better balance sheets so they can be acquirers. Uh, there might be some names we've owned or own now that we would view as potentially uh, being um, acquired as well. But fundamentally, their free cash flow generation and their uh, return of that cash flow to us is why we own the names. So I think we have a very healthy uh, portfolio of healthcare dividend growth names that happens to be with some of the industry leaders. Now, when you look then to um, the, the types of things that, that we really want to see both in the cyclical and non-cyclical portion of our portfolio, I want to remind people that the basic things that were needed to run the world um, before coronavirus and right now during the quarantine and even when we get on the other side of the quarantine, many of those things are going to be the exact same things. Okay, microprocessors to feed computer technology use is not going away. The need for networks and servers and routers is not going away. Um, the need for laundry detergent and, and hopefully with antibacterial soap, the need is going even higher. I, I believe we'll end up with a wonderful society of hand washers as certainly everyone in my family has become. So across the consumer staples, your bottled waters, your snacks and beverages, uh, your, I mentioned some of the types of stores that, that sell low price goods that people need to be able to access quickly. Oftentimes they have a great e-com platform as well. Um, and you look into the uh, a wide array of sector diversification that we have in our cyclical and non-cyclical portfolio. We don't believe that any of the things that are represented in the companies we owned pre-COVID or right now or post-COVID that any of those items are any less needed 
or will be any less needed than ever. We think their profit margins, their profit aspirations, and we in fact think in some cases there will be a, a higher demand for those products. Um, what we want to very much avoid in, is the belief, and I alluded to this last week in Dividend Cafe, talk about a new normal and there being all these different new trends that mean something they don't mean. There's going to be plenty of new trends. Some of them will be very short-lived, some of them will be longer lasting. I would not want to form an investment policy right now on guessing how Americans are going to live in two years based on how they've lived in the five weeks of quarantine. But I would certainly grant that there will be plenty of social and societal ramifications. But from the vantage point of monetizing with stability and minimizing risk, you want to be focused on things the world needs to run. And I will propose to you that everything we own in our dividend portfolio comes out of companies we think are making goods and services that pre, during, and post-COVID are needed to make the world run. Now, someone could say, okay, well, oil and gas, and I, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the whole kind of misunderstandings of the oil pricing here today. Uh, certainly, the demand is eroded right now for oil and gas with uh, no one being able to go anywhere. And then the supply in the month of March had hit record levels high. It was a perfect potpourri to collapse oil prices. But of course, oil ultimately has to be priced along a forward curve. And that forward curve right now is in the most contango we've ever seen it. It's not backward, meaning there are higher prices for short-term months and lower prices long-term. It's the opposite. Because, of course, uh, those that are having to make bets and, make ex and set expectations within their own businesses are well aware that they believe oil is going to cost more when the economy is running than when it is not running. And, and our belief is that oil and gas were priced for the shutdown. They, but they have not been priced for the reopening. And, and yes, it's true that some of the oil and gas companies we own are really up in the last several weeks. have seen huge percentage moves to higher, where they were down big in March, have come back a lot in April. But the fact of the matter is we want to be invested along the theme of where companies will be in six months and a year, not where they'll be in six hours or six days. And oil and gas as a commodity is a great example of, of differentiating between short-term and more intermediate-term concerns. Now, along those lines, both with the oil and gas producers and the pipeline companies, we have reallocated our equity portfolio to be pretty much exclusively focused on what we consider to be the strongest names in the space, the biggest, baddest, richest names in the space, meaning their balance sheet, their access to credit, their access to liquidity, their profits, their lower leverage ratios, their debt to um, various measurements, that those pipeline companies that may have impairments to their business ultimately benefit as some of the weaker pipeline companies end up going away and more opportunities come to the stronger companies. Same thing in the production side. Uh, history is filled with examples of this. So it's a huge theme of ours, not only to not abandon the concept of oil and gas, but to uh, be invested in it with strength, not with weakness both in pipelines and producers. Um, I think that it is a really important concept to, to wrap our heads around when people start thinking about areas that there will be opportunity for investors coming out of this uh, era to understand that a lot of the greatest innovations, some of the greatest changes and, and investable opportunities will start with private companies. They will not necessarily all start with $300 billion multinational uh, conglomerates. That, that I think a lot of the great opportunity will come out of private equity. And to the extent that illiquid investments are already a big theme of ours, that we see a huge non-correlation theme for that alternative sleeve of our client portfolios. But uh, for those investors who are not needing current cash flow from this portion of their portfolio, we very much believe that you will be able to better monetize some of the opportunities that come out of post-COVID innovation in private equity than you will in public equity. Along those lines, it's a somewhat different subject, but it has a connection. Um, there's a couple of publicly traded alternative asset managers 
But one of the things that is so interesting to me is that there was this huge liability hanging over them and other names in that space, the private equity, private credit uh, managers. Uh, throughout 2019 and coming into 2020, I probably read 100 white papers or research papers on how are these companies going to do when they're sitting on so much excess cash. They have so much dry powder and there's just not going to be enough investment opportunity out there. Everything is so richly priced. There's not enough new innovations. So these private equity players with all this cash are going to have to settle for lower return opportunities because they have to invest that money at some point and there won't be something to invest it in. And all of a sudden, the weakness in credit, the, the deleveraging, the, the kind of Darwinian effects in the marketplace, and a lot of the new opportunities and transformational things happening around um, COVID and going into a post-COVID society have meant that that cash on hand, that dry powder, for some of those asset managers, that dry powder becomes a huge asset. Now, we can't do anything about the um, volatility these names trade with uh, to the extent that a lot of their um, you know, fees come back to performance. And if there is a slow period, there may be concern in the market that they're not going to generate what's called the promote or the carry at the same level. Uh, I, I don't share those concerns. I feel very optimistic about the names, but I, I don't have any outlook for them in the next month or three months. These are longer term views, but we really believe thematically that the liability of dry powder has become an asset and we want to be invested alongside of that and make money with that on behalf of our clients. This is very much in line with what I said about the whole things necessary to make the whole world work. But see, I've been talking about this for almost 20 years. I've been in love with the consumer staple sector forever and a whole lot of names I've always loved in that sector became uninvestable for me over a certain period of time because they just got so high in valuation, their dividend yields fell so much. Um, there's always been a few names that we've really had and enjoyed, but the, one of the reasons I like the consumer staple space pretty much all the time is it's never the highest performing sector or very rarely, if ever, and never the lowest performing sector. It's always kind of that middle of the ground space and, and, and middle of the ground can be negative when the whole market's negative. It can be positive. It generally is when the whole market's positive. But it's usually what you would refer to on a baseball analogy since we're not watching any real baseball. Um, a sector that hits a lot of singles and doubles but doesn't hit a lot of home runs and doesn't strike out a lot. Well, so a lot of these names have traded because they do make cleaning supplies or certain durable um, household items that are almost somewhat connected, even though they're not pharmaceutical, connected to uh, the COVID situation. But even when you look at the kind of um, uh, food and snack items that really don't go up and down with the economy, that people are generally still drinking water and soda pop and juices and things like that um, at any period of time. We really like the consumer staple sector and we think we have uh, invested in very high quality names in our portfolio that again, don't just have a few years of consistent dividend growth, don't, and not only have the balance sheet to continue that even through difficult times, but have decades upon decades of dividend growth uh, that should give investors all of the optimism they need to feel good about this going forward as we wait to get on the other side of this COVID-driven cyclical recession. Um, when you get into the financial sector, that's been the area that's been beat up the most most recently. It was probably the second worst performer behind uh, energy in March, and now energy has been one of the best, best performers in April, yet the financial sector has still struggled. But it's imperative that we understand the nature of the struggle. In 2008, you can call it, quite literally, an existential struggle. They had negative equity. That's pretty existential, don't you think? It means they were functionally insolvent companies, that um, their, the leverage they had taken on around mortgage, that as it blew up in the financial crisis, had resulted in them having a negative equity in their business. And it was a liquidity infusion, but ultimately a solvency issue that was at the heart of those financial institutions brought on by an unbelievable amount of leverage that then had to play out over time and ultimately involved very controversial measurements, both from fiscal through TARP and then from monetary through the Fed. Well, right now, there is no question that banks make less money when there's a lower demand for credit. And there's a lower demand for credit when no one can leave their house and when no one can go to work and when businesses can't go expand. 
there's going to be a compression of loan growth. And yet, I would say that uh, banks um, are not facing anything close to existential. They are dealing with a dramatically lower leverage, dramatically higher liquidity, significantly higher equity. So comparing the experience of banks and what is the cyclical challenges now to the structural challenges of 08 is not comparing apples to oranges, it's comparing apples to a desk. It just doesn't make any sense at all. All that said, tactically, we, similar to our theme with staples and energy, want to be focused in strength. We have two more traditional type bank names, one life insurer and, and one kind of custodian asset manager, um, all that represent the financial portion of the portfolio, again, that are going to come out of this in a much better place uh, and maintain their dividends along the way. So when you look at those equity themes, you do see some constants mostly focused around where we believe things will be on the post-COVID side and yet maintaining that dividend growth for our clients who withdraw money along the way and opportunistically for clients who don't withdraw money, we want to keep that dividend reinvestment going because we want to be able to get that share reinvestment at lower prices so that accumulation benefit and that um, uh, we, Consistency of withdrawal capacity is very important in our philosophy. That was obviously true well before COVID. It was obviously true for many, many years for my career. But right now we're living through a kind of stress testing of the philosophy that I believe is being met exactly how we would expect it to be, given the severity of everything going on. On the fixed income side, I want to move forward quickly so we can get to um, Q&A. It is very much our opinion that bonds, uh, meaning treasuries, we have a 10-year offering below 1%, effectively 0% rates for all shorter data type bonds. The only bonds offering any income at all are bonds that have a spread to treasuries, and that would include right now municipals, it would include corporate bonds, and it would include other riskier bonds that we would call credit. Uh, so whether that was high yield, bank loans, emerging market debt, they're in a, a kind of riskier category, um, but they have a wider spread to Treasury, so they're offering a little bit of opportunity. First and foremost, on the municipal side, they've recovered about half, um, about 40%, getting close to half of that kind of missed marking from, that took place in the month of March. When you had AAA, highly performing mini bonds that just simply couldn't get sold, there was no bid. A lot of that normalization has come back for some of the lower rated or more thinly traded or odd lot municipal bonds. There's still some dislocation and we're dealing with the traders. I'm literally talking to the portfolio managers every single day as we try to work towards that. And we think that inevitable move towards normalization. Uh, the Fed has provided some support here, but keep in mind they legally in the facility they set can only buy six month paper. So they've really helped a lot on the shorter dated municipals, not as much on the longer dated, but it has still nevertheless provided a much healthier backdrop into municipals. But when we look into that structured credit side, I put in a chart here of the asset backed security sell off um, during the end of March. So you could get a chance to see just on a relative basis how much spreads blew out in asset backed securities. Um, week by week, you always had a, a widening spread, but then all of a sudden it blew out of nowhere. Now, a lot of those spreads have come in to some degree, but again, with really highly senior secured assets that are collateralized by baskets of credit card debt or auto loans or other issues where they are highest up in the cap structure, they get paid first, and so lowest in the risk pool. Um, to, to the, we believe that there's a great opportunity, but there's going to be volatility there. We don't want to be in the space for people that do not have a kind of tolerance for volatility. When one treats their bonds like bonds as a safety parking lot, it's high-grade investment uh, cor uh, corporate bonds, it, it's treasuries, it's Fannie and Freddie, your agency residential mortgage-backed securities. But when one wants to be more opportunistic, we think that there is some really significant shakeout coming that will, will be quite opportunistic. And we've been uh, really heavily researching um, the ways in which we plan to take advantage of that as well. But as a broad conclusion about bonds, not the more opportunistic structured credit space, the securitized um, silo, but looking into traditional bonds, 
we talked a month ago about our plan being that we wanted to be able to trim off of bonds to be prepared to allocate some of that capital into equities. And right now, um, we think that we accidentally have gotten very lucky in that our um, inability to sell bonds at prices we wanted a few weeks ago helped us because now, whether it's in two days or two weeks, as we're able to trim 15, 20, 25 percent off of our bond allocations, which would raise somewhere from 7 to 12 to 15 percent cash, we have no intention of dumping that all into equities at one time. Now, some clients have requested that we do so, and some clients you know, probably are wise to want that. They have a risk tolerance that they don't care about the volatility that might come in the next three, six, nine months. But because we believe that we're that phase one of that equity recovery happened so quickly, and that phase two is going to be a grind, if you remember my word from earlier, we want to basically tether the money we're able to pull from healthier prices out of bonds into equities over a four month, six month, nine month process. And, and we're fully prepared for the fact that maybe we're gonna end up buying equities at higher prices than they are now along the way. But what we think is very likely is not that we're gonna be buying at 29,000 or that we're gonna be buying at 19,000, but that we're gonna be buying at up and down prices um, because of the volatility we expect around the news cycle and around the sort of challenges the economy faces in the months and quarters ahead. So the macro realities that uh, I'm going to conclude with here, very important. The, the, there's nothing I learned more out of the financial crisis than the primacy of liquidity and the fact that cash cannot, in a global economy, go hide under a bed. And I've read as many books and white papers and, and academic journals on this subject as anybody could. And the one really kind of easy pedestrian takeaway I can offer you is that when liquidity is reflating in the economy, it absolutely means there will end up being investable opportunity. Cash cannot go hide under a bed. It has to be in its eternal search for a return on that capital. And I, you can look where I've circled here on the chart there, the amount of treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, this quote-unquote other is about to take on new form because they're coming into the corporate bond space, municipal bond, a greater percentage of asset-backed securities. The Fed is going to be essentially creating several trillion dollars minimum, very possibly much more than that. I may be on the low end of how much they end up adding to their balance sheet, which then gets put on the excess reserves of banks. And, and it, the idea is for it to circulate into the economy to reflate the corporate economy. I have no opinion when I say this about what day all of a sudden you're going to see the Dow jump up because of it. My opinion is that there will be investable opportunity that comes of it that will play out perhaps starting in 2020, certainly in 2021 and whatnot, that becomes very opportunistic in private equity, in public equity, in credit, in risk assets, that that reflation will be a significant trade on the other side of COVID. Uh, from the safety standpoint, and right now when I look at the, the things that are most important for us on a risk adjusted basis, um, people saying, we, what are you going to do? How do you price earnings right now? Well, they're exactly right. You can't price earnings right now. There's no way to really understand a normalized understanding of what a company earned in the last few weeks or months, and there's not going to be a way to understand it for several weeks and months going forward. And that's obviously how ultimately stocks get measured, is uh, 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 in, encapsulation of their discounted earnings. What you will know, though, are companies that have balance sheets that can get through things, that have cash on hand, that have a more mature debt profile, that maybe have no debt profile, lower leverage rates. Balance sheets are going to trump income statements, and that's where we want to be very conscientious of the balance sheet stability we're bringing to our client public equity holdings. Um, don't fight the Fed's an eternal truism. We can talk about the Fed. I do it as much as anyone ever should, much to my family's chagrin. We can talk about the things that the Fed does that we don't like or don't believe in. But what we cannot do is talk about um, the investment merits of fighting the Fed. It has not been a very good trade for about 100 years. To the degree we have a lot more visibility right now to what the Fed is doing and what their mentality is in 2020 than we did in late 2008, early 2009. 
That visibility came in stages over the months and even years to come throughout the Bernanke era. The Fed is in a very quick period of time told you their intention in supporting capital markets. And quickly so we can get to Q&A, uh, it would be hard for me to have a more bearish view on Europe. My view is essentially that Europe is going to come out of this worse than the U.S. and Asia and that they started off worse than the U.S. and Asia and, and um, therefore the currency pressures, fiscal pressures, and, and uh, macroeconomic sort of incoherence that exists in the continent of Europe we think is going to um, be worsened uh, by the COVID situation. I very much expect a categorical change of China's relationship to the U.S. and the world that has a lot of stock market implications, it has a lot of macroeconomic implications, and of course it has a lot of geopolitical implications, and I plan to be fully covering this in the weeks and months ahead in Dividend Cafe. Um, and I think this is, is kind of a restatement of some things I said earlier, but the Fed policy evolution will be eventually downstream asset support, meaning they've started off really supporting some of the highest quality assets. Ultimately, as we saw with TALF back in 2009, we think they'll have to move downstream in some of the assets they support either directly or indirectly. They've already created some of the facilities to do so. We don't want to lose sight of that. But then the thing they have not done yet that is really important for people to understand is what we would call yield curve control. When the Fed is essentially the only buyer when the government is issuing so much treasury debt to fund its deficits and the Fed is the one going in to buy hundreds of billions of dollars of treasuries, they can essentially control the shape of the yield curve by how much 30 years, 10 years, 5 years, 30 you know, days, 90 day T-bills. They can uh, shape the curve the way that they want and it will be very important for astute investors, particularly on the bond side, to, to get in front of that. So. I did uh, chew off quite a bit, and now I'm going to go into the Q&A. Um, one, one individual asked uh, repositioning around some of the equity portfolio, uh, particularly some of the pipeline changes and so forth. And I think I spoke to that earlier. It was really just part of a very, very high conviction belief that the highest quality pipeline companies in oil and gas traded down to a level that of generational dividend yield opportunities a lot of the technical reason that the high quality names traded down so much is because they were part of the ETFs that were just getting killed, margin called, sold off. So th there was this constant selling pressure and good names gave us a chance to swap out the baskets of, of MLPs, oil and gas pipelines, and replace it with just what we consider to be the best of breed names. It was entirely driven by a quality swap, and that was why we made those changes. Um, in terms of other changes that we see forthcoming, we've already made some. There's definitely a pretty good list of about a half a dozen names we'd love to add to the portfolio, but right now we consider the dividend portfolio fully invested, and there's obviously you know plenty of things that are subject to change anytime. What, uh, one client asked if I would ever consider recommending clients invest with cheap borrowed cash, and the answer is a unambiguous, unwavering no. Um, we do not believe in borrowing money collateralized by the risk assets you're buying to buy more of the risk assets. I'm sure there are still some advisors that didn't go out of business in uh, .com and during the financial crisis that may recommend it, but we don't and never will uh, recommend it. Um, and so it, it is to us outside of the risk profile that is appropriate for um, the investors we work with. Short-term, mid-term, long-term, what I mean by those terms, I am defining, because you're right, they are somewhat relative, but for our purposes, this isn't necessarily scientific, so the context in a particular sentence may change, um, but I would say short-term, I mean three months, mid-term, I mean a year, long-term, I mean uh, beyond that, and generally, we work with people we want to still have capital for over a year, so we consider most of our primary focus to be on the long-term aspect of things. Um, oh, a really thoughtful question here on inflation. Will we go towards inflation with all this uh, influx of liquidity from the government? And it's a great question, and it's frankly one that's been really commonly asked. And I do want to point out that we luckily get to cheat a little, because we have the empirical evidence of history here that the uh, amount of liquidity the Fed added after the financial crisis, they had approximately a 500, 600 is a more fair number, $600 billion balance sheet 
and they added about four trillion dollars to that balance sheet between QE1, QE2, and QE3. Lasted from basically 2009 until 2014. In this case, they added a couple trillion in just a few weeks, and we certainly see their roadmap going out several trillion more, including the leverage they're able to put on some of the Treasury Department money from the CARES Act that they will lever up to support some of these facilities they've created with small businesses, Main Street lending, uh, the TALF 2.0 to buy asset-backed securities, things like that. You're talking about trillions of dollars. So the question is, will that be inflationary? And of course, the answer out of the financial crisis and four trillion of assets created out of nowhere was it was deflationary. It didn't create any new inflation other than in asset prices, which is what they were trying to inflate. Um, the reason of it being that there is so much excessive debt that it constrains the ability for that money to circulate in the marketplace and be put to productive use. So there is both an awful answer to your question and then probably what some people think is a good answer. Because the good answer is it probably won't be inflationary and it will boost up the value of your risk assets. So people holding stocks and real estate like I do and you do are probably thinking this is great. But the problem is that it, there's no free lunch. It comes at the cost of future growth. And so what I believe we will see, and I'll be doing so much writing on this in the months and quarters ahead, it will bother you. I believe that the post-COVID ramifications of the Fed will be bad, but not the bad people are expecting. Now, if they do become inflationary, it would be because it worked too well, that that money circulated and then a velocity of money picked up in the economy that, that necessitated highly inflationary circumstances. And of course, we know what the Fed would do to deal with a significant runaway inflation. They would extract that liquidity just as quickly as they put it in. That would be recessionary and contractionary, but they at least know the playbook for dealing with inflation. The reason why central banks are always so much more aggressive on deflationary um, pressures is because they don't know exactly what to do and, and so they have to kind of throw a full kitchen sink at things. I think that um, all of this is a moving target, but in the very immediate short-term issue, the inflation-protected treasury bonds are pricing in 0% inflation for five years right now. So uh, there are plenty of metrics that kind of help support. Of course, it's a lot easier to assume low inflation when you see $20 oil than when you get back to $40 oil. But my point being that... Um, the Fed knows that governments around the world, particularly ours, are running trillion, two trillion dollar annual deficits on top of 20, 25 trillion dollar national debts. Those are hyper deflationary pressures that have to be dealt with. Okay. Um, I'm going to do one more question and then uh, I will um, answer some of these privately after, the, after we close up. Uh, but just one person asking if I thought there'd be any ramification to all this uh, in the fall election. And there most certainly will be. I don't think that anyone could predict it right now. Um, you, you're, you understand we're in the middle of April. And where we will be in the economy, where we will be in the health pandemic itself, uh, will have an awful lot to do with where we are in the actual uh, election you know, uh, sentiment. Um, so that you could easily spin some of the circumstances right now for how they'll be beneficial to the incumbent and you could spin them for how they'll be detrimental to the incumbent. But I don't really think we know the answer because we have to see what some of the economy uh, recovery, economic recovery and economic reflation looks like, uh, not to mention the sort of national psyche and psychology around the health pandemic as we get further along. So there's sort of an unknown there. Um, I hope this has been helpful for you. If we do get feedback that you did benefit from it, I'm very happy to do more of these. Uh, God knows I'm not going anywhere. So if I'm sitting here at my desk talking to you on the phone, dealing with client accounts, I'm very happy to every couple of weeks do another one of these if they're worthwhile. But of course, between our daily COVID at markets.com, our weekly dividendcafe.com, I'm trying my very best to stay in heavy communication with you and create very real-time updates on our perspective and how we're seeing the world and what we plan to do on behalf of our client portfolios. Thank you very much for your time today. Reach out with follow-up questions, and we will get through this together. Be free and be well, and be safe.
God bless.